Father Along will know all about it. Father Along will understand why. Cheer up our brothers, live in the sunshine. We'll understand it all by and by. are made to be sang with your eyes closed when you get to the familiar words and let the water run through the creases. Tempted and tried were oft made to one another. Tempted and tried were oft made to wonder why it should be my mouth and the meditations of my heart be made acceptable in thy sight. You, God, are our strength 
and our Redeemer. So right now, once and again, let your word go forth. And never to come back void, but accomplish the purpose for which it is sent. In that blessed, precious, saving name of Jesus, we do pray. And God, we give you thanks. Let every heart say together, Amen. 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 We are still standing in the presence of God and each other. Turn with me to the gospel as recorded by St. Mark, the ninth chapter. And I want to begin reading at the 51st verse. There's an art to singing hymns. I love all this other music. Uh, but when you really need something, I dare you to find a genre of music that has the power and the lyrical substance of a hymn. You got to sing it from a, you got to sing it from a guttural place. A hymn is designed to take you there. And uh, I thank God for some old school musicians. Now I didn't call them old. I just said old school. And to some of our younger musicians and young adults, I want you all to, to bathe in these waters and learn this stuff. Amen. Because uh, life will present you with some stuff that hip-hop has no answers for. You got to go back and get your grandmama's song. Because it was like, uh, like most of the stuff she cooked, it was made in a crock pot, nice and slow. Luke 9. I said Mark? Oh, I'm sorry. See, that's what a hymn will do to you. It'll make folk run out their clothes and forget which book of the Bible. Yeah, my mama used to shout and have to go collect up her clothes from all over the church. <laughs> I say, Mama, I don't mind you shouting because you just stay dressed. <laughs> yeah, I ain't lying, Emma Beverly. <laughs> As the time approached for Jesus to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome Jesus because he was headed for Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven and destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. And he and his disciples went to another village. As they were walking along the road, a man said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and the birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But the man replied, Lord, I first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Scripture as it is written and our prayer is always that we would uh, bless the reading and the hearing of his most holy word. You may be seated in the presence uh, of the Lord and each other. We thank God to see Deacons Taylor who are here from, where y'all living now, Phoenix? Amen. Amen. They wanted to get some sunshine to enhance their tan. <laughs> and uh, turn to your neighbor, take him by the hand and say, neighbor, neighbor. Don't, drive don't drive in the wrong lane. Um, uh, I want to um, 
use as a subject for uh, this morning. Uh, I want to nuance a little bit from the early service. Lanes that Christians need to stay out of. Lanes that Christians need to stay out of. And some of you saw from my uh, Facebook uh, post that on Friday evening I was in Kennesaw, Georgia with my sister Felicia, her husband Dwayne, most importantly with my nephew Jair, their son, um, because I had promised him uh, years ago, a while back, that I would uh, be present for at least one of his uh, football games before he graduated high school. And since this Friday was their last home game, uh, it pretty much uh, made it clear which game I needed to attend. So I flew down there, we enjoyed the game, and we got home from the game at a little bit after 11 p.m. And my flight coming back to Seattle uh, on yesterday, Saturday morning, was leaving at 6.45 a.m. and I would have to get up at 3.15 a.m. to get to Atlanta National Airport on time, which means it was a quick couple hours of what I call a snatch of sleep, a snatch of sleep. And I was empowered with a stiff cup of coffee, we set out for the airport and for a 45 minute drive from Kennesaw, even at the light traffic of, of 4.30 in the morning. Um, but in the Atlanta area, those of you who've been there, you know that uh, there's wide highways. It's not like our pathetic situation here was sometimes what, at its widest, it may be five lanes and in some places it shrinks to three and don't let them be doing construction. But the lanes are usually eight to ten lanes wide. Um, and you have to be careful watching not just the signs over here, but also the markings actually on the lanes, on the ground. Because Kennesaw is north of Atlanta, and to get to the airport, you have to take um, Interstate 75 South. I was listening to the, to the lady in the GPS who was directing me through it, telling me not only which road to get on, but which lane to be in. Because if you're going on Interstate, I, Interstate 75 South, as you make your way, it, 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 you can't get too far to the right, Jerry, because it'll it, it veer you off to 85 South and take you off to Tampa or Chattanooga. And if you get caught in the wrong lane, you would be headed to the wrong city and it'll take you God knows how long to get back to where you want to go. And they come up on you quickly. And you had to be careful, the lady told me, don't go too far to the left, stay in the middle lanes because the left, it would veer you off in the Interstate 20, which take you around the inner loop of the city and into and through Atlanta, but I'm trying to get to the airport. And so while I was on that road, I had to make sure that I was in the right lane lest I didn't get caught up in traffic and get detoured somewhere along the way. And I learned from that that you can, in fact, be on the right road you still got to be careful for the lane Amen. that you're in. And this highway of holiness, this highway to the kingdom of God, there are some lanes that we have to be careful not to get into. Ah, right. And Jesus, the master teacher, uh, whose chosen primary method of teaching was through parable, short, pithy, windows into the realities of our lives. He chooses a deductive mode of teaching here about the kingdom and this highway and problematic lanes. Um, when it starts with an, an, an occasion of offense, he had a way of taking our worst moments, being polite, and turn them into teaching moments. And there, and, and in so doing, we learn of four lanes that Christians, if we're going to be useful to the kingdom, if our lives are going to bear any fruit, if we're going to have any credible witness, if there's going to be any gains out of all this testimony about who we believe in, and what we 
hope to, to God for. That we've got to be careful on this highway to stay out of some lanes that will certainly take us on some destructive, meandering detours that will take us away from any intentions of God that are clung to our lives. And, and it started when Jesus, who sets his own GPS for Jerusalem, where after three years of preaching and teaching, he now must go to Jerusalem and pay a debt he did not owe. Because each of us have a debt we could not pay. To offer himself up as a propitiation for the sins of the world. He sets his face toward Jerusalem and taking the most direct route that would take him through Samaria. That those of you who are biblical readers know that that was the land of their enemies. There was an antipathy between Jews and Samaritans that went back seven centuries. I don't have time to explore that in historical detail now, but there... There was antipathy between Jews and Samaritans. A, a good Jew even defined their goodness by avoiding those people. And as he had given a precursor to this occasion, the kind of tensions when he met the woman at the well in the fourth chapter, and he says, you being Jew, why are you even talking to me? We don't talk to each other, and when we do, it's not peaceably or nice. And now again, as he sets course for Jerusalem, he sends... Uh, James and John of Zebedee, who had the street name of Sons of Thunder, and they earned it the old-fashioned way uh, through, through having a lightning rod temper, a thin skin, uh, who, never forgot the slight, who never forgot the slightest offense. Jesus sends um, his most dispositionally challenged disciples into the most difficult place to make arrangements. As Tupac said, we ain't meant to survive because it's a setup. If ever there was a setup, that was a setup. Somebody said that's a setup. You're going to send your, your, your mean, it's like putting the meanest honorary person in the church and making them a greeter. That's a setup. They need to be in set up and break down working behind, but they don't need to be, come on somebody. I've always wondered, why do mean people want to be greeters and ushers? <laughs> James and John don't belong on no greeting ministry. Somebody say amen. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to bless somebody right now. And... And, and, and in, in so doing, we learn about the first lane that Christians, if you're going to bear any fruit for the kingdom, that you have to stay out of on this highway to the kingdom of God, that's what they call the choleric road. Somebody say the choleric. The choleric road. If you, if you look up choleric, Webster's going to tell you it's angry, it's agitated, it's volatile, it's, it's sensitive, it's irritated. It, it comes etymologically from the same root where we get the word cholera. If anyone ever seen a colic a baby, it is a baby that screams and rants to the point where they're not really crying anymore. The baby is literally in a rage and they cry so harsh, so sh such a shrill manner for so long it can override the paternal and maternal uh, adorations for that child and make you want to take your own little bundle of love and throw it out a window. <laughs> I'm not suggesting you do that, but anybody who's had a baby that cried too loud for too long and the things you imagine, help us God. <laughs> and, and the cleric road is the road of anger. The road of anger that has gotten out of control is saved and sanctified as we are on this road to this highway to heaven, this kingdom bound pathway. If we don't watch ourselves in traffic, we can get caught on that cleric road. These disciples who had walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus, now they found themselves in a situation as Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem and they went to seek lodging and a big old vacancy sign. But then when they showed up looking for rooms, they said, we have no rooms for you. Because they said they knew he was going to Jerusalem, that he was a Jew. And Samaritans, even when there's vacancies, they didn't have any vacancies for Jews. And James and John, being true to their names, sons of, sons of, uh, 
thunder, the sons of Zebedee, be, Zebedee being the, the uh, cut buddies from around the block that they were, they then turned to the master and they said, should we rain down fire and torch the place? These ain't bloods of crips, these are disciples of Jesus. The, think about what is happening here. These are they that they have walked with the master. They, they, have, they have seen him turn water to wine. They have seen the power of God work through Jesus to lift a man from a pool who had been there 38 years and to heal in an instant what almost four decades had done to him. They saw him release a woman at a well who had had a, a questionable life, free her from her habitual and, and chronic addictive relationships and set her free to become an evangelist and not a, a, a lifelong mistress. They had, they, they had seen the power of God take legion naked and crazy out the tombs and end up finding him calm and clothed. They saw the power of God take leprosy out of the tin that he placed his hands on and sent them on their way to be certified whole by the police. They'd seen the power of God bring sight into blind eyes and hearing into deaf ears and strength to paralyzed limbs. And now they literally consciously asked Jesus, can we take that same power and burn the roof off the sucker? They literally, Tony, I asked, Lord, can we take your power and do a drive-by? This is the choleric road. And, and Jesus, it says he whirls on them. And that word that we have in English as world is the same as a, a, the, the physiological reference to a whirlwind. He turns quickly. It is, it is a sign of his indignation at what you have just suggested. How, do you realize what you just said? That the power that was given to bring life, you want us to use it to bring death because of an injury, because of a slight, because of an insult because of an abrasion, because of an offense. And if we don't watch ourselves, we too who have seen the power of God do great things in people's lives, starting with our own, we too who have seen the power of God and what it can do in the lives of moments. As we're driving on this high wheel of holiness, Lord knows we still walking with feet of clay, have the potential to find ourselves on that choleric lane. So the Bible says be angry and 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 sin not. Think about that for a moment. The Bible never said don't be angry. The Bible did not say that offense will not register. The Bible did not say we don't have feelings. The Bible never said things don't hurt or that we can get so holy we can't be hurt. And, and, and so the, in this sense the Bible is saying being hurt, being offended when bigotry has slapped you in the face. Is, is understandable and being offended when sexism has blocked your path or put a, a glass ceiling on your possibilities being offended when when homophobia even shows up in holy places and when people will take all your music and your song and then turn around and call you an abomination <laughs> after using your very gift and genius to, to, to get closer to God. To, 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 to be offended when you kneel quietly and reverently, not interrupt the, the, the national anthem, not interrupt the color guard presenting the flag, still have just as much football, and then the same people who watch him fly the Confederate flag before an old Miss game and say nothing are mad because you kneel because they don't care that you have to talk to your son about how to deal with the police. The Bible never says that this should not make you angry, but what it is teaching when it says, but sin not, is that while anger is understandable, that, that, that still, if you act in it, it's still destructive. And so even while anger is understandable, it doesn't excuse you for doing that which is yet destructive. Hmm? That's why Jesus said, turn the other cheek. Bless those who curse you, pray for those who hate you, do good to those who despitefully use you. Paul would paraphrase Jesus and say, recompense no one evil, no one evil for evil, but overcome evil with good. There's a sad story about uh, two ladies, and it was a Sunday morning, and they, uh, one lady was at a, had a turn, and, and her car stopped, and she couldn't get it started, and the traffic, of course, was building up behind her, and an impatient driver behind her started laying into the horn. It was another woman. And... Um, the woman tried, tried, and couldn't get her car moving, and the lady behind her was just laying into the horn. 
And the woman in the front of the car got, was not only frustrated because she couldn't get her car going, but she was angry at the driver behind her. I mean, it's kind of obvious. Obviously, if I could get it going, I would get it going. And you laying on that horn ain't helping me none. And you frowning up at me ain't helping me none neither. And then finally, she turned her attention away when she tried to get the car going again. It couldn't get going. The lady's still laying into the horn. She turned her attention from the problems with the car to the problems she was having with the lady behind her laying on that horn. Lady got out her car, walked back to the car, slammed on the window, and said to her, I tell you what, why don't you go on up there and get the car started, and I'll sit back here and lay on the horn. <laughs> One word led to another, and these, these otherwise dignified women literally got in a fist fight, was rolling around on the street. The police had to come. They was both taken off to jail. Both their cars had to be towed away, but that's not even the worst part, Priscilla. The worst part is the lady who was in the first car who started and went back and slapped the woman and started the fight. It was the pastor's wife <laughs> on her way to church, and the lady behind her was on her way to the same church. She was going to be a first-time visitor. <laughs> not a good look. <laughs> It's hard to do the master's will when you slapping up the visitors. And it don't mean that you don't run across somebody in church that don't deserve to be slapped up. Just don't do it. Touch your neighbor and say, just don't do it. Right now we have an American electorate that has gotten in the wrong lane. Anger is what defines the behavior of the American electorate. Before the 2016 electorate, all we have to talk about is angry Americans, angry Americans, angry Americans, but nobody ever read to them the gospels of be angry, but still vote like you got some sense. Don't vote in anger. Don't vote for somebody who speaks to your anger. Huh? They voted for somebody who many Americans, enough Americans voted for somebody who spoke to their anger. And Jesus says, the light shineth in the darkness and the darkness cannot consume it. Listen, as Christians, we're to bring light to the world, not heat to the world. Huh? When you, when you speak heat, when you bring an overheated rhetoric to a people who are already in darkness and you have heat and darkness, that's literally what hell is like. Darkness and heat. Christians are supposed to shed light to the darkness. We have a country that is percolating in, in, in darkness. We, we saw an inaugural address that many could describe as a dystopian vision, not, not America's shining city on a hill, not a place called hope, not yes we can, but America is in a meltdown and the only hope for it is that you use me and I'll make America great again, again like what? But anger, when people speak to the anger, people anger because of their economic frustrations, the flatlining of the wages of the American middle class. It goes back 30 years to the president that they love, who was also the president who did more to debase the economic position of the American worker when they began to assail collective bargaining and the union movement. And, 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 and here are people with flat wages working for corporations who are experiencing record profits that are going to shareholders and CEOs who are getting record bonuses even when their companies fail but the workers themselves are getting a smaller and smaller share of the fruits of their own labors and yet keep attaching themselves to the very people who are stealing from them every day because in all the heat nobody's shedding any light in the wrong lane voting angry rather than voting enlightened Jesus stay out of this road because whether it's in politics whether it's in church or whether it's in your personal life anger will take you off on the detour somewhere and you will not advance kingdom business but no sooner had he done that and Jesus moved on he says another man approached him Jesus didn't even start the conversation another man approached him and said Lord I'm ready to go with you wherever and whereas the first lane was called the choleric lane the lane about anger the second lane is called the sanguine lane if you look at the sanguine, it's going to look up and it's going to say happy, yeah, optimistic, jovial. This is the, 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 the person who's just bubbling and effervescent and percolating. The person with that long, god-awfully long answering machine, the <laughs> voicemail to the email. Rather than just getting straight to it, leave a message, God bless you, they want to give you a song, a sermon, a text. <laughs> Got you cussing on the other end because they, you don't have all that time. Yeah. Reverend, why didn't you leave a message? I didn't have all that time. 
and, and here is a person who says, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both. I'm ready to get you, go with you wherever you go. And you would think that Jesus would affirm that, but instead he rebukes it. He rebukes it when he says to him, he says, foxes have holes. The birds of the air have nests. There's no place for the Son of Man to lay his head. This, this echoes with likeness to the exchange he would have with Peter in the garden before he would be arrested. When Peter said, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both into prison and into death. And the Lord quickly rebuked him and said, the rooster would not crow three times. But the rooster would not crow before morning breaks before you have denied me three times. Peter, you're just talking. You set your mouth in motion before you set your mind in gear. You haven't counted up the cost. You might really believe what you're saying, like James and John of Zebedee who came to Jesus and said, we want to see at the right hand of the left of your kingdom. And he said, you don't know what you ask. Can you drink from the cup that I drink from? And there are people out there who will promise you the world, but they haven't given any thought to that. And Jesus isn't looking for people to just start talking and start promising stuff and that he knows they're not going to be good for. He tells the parable about the seed and the different types of soils. When the gospel seed hits the soils, he says some of them seeds landed on shallow ground. Sprout roots quickly and fruit shot up. But the slightest little bit of sunlight came out and scorched the earth. And them seeds died. Why? Because they had no depth to the roots. Huh? And some people come in, they have a good feeling. They're driven by emotion, but not by the depth of conviction. Promises made out of emotion. Emotions are fickle. They, they switch like northwest weather. Sunny in the morning, raining by noon. I'll go with you. This, this is the, 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 the people who promise you everything. They go, ooh, ooh, we love new beginnings. Love it, love it. Choir sing the song. They ain't done yet. They come right on back in. Ooh, we love new beginnings you know you don't have to get all dressed up you be casual if you want to we love new beginnings got the baddest band in the northwest we love new beginnings they got a coffee bar oh we love new beginnings the pastor's all young and don't preach too long we love <laughs> say amen no seriously say amen yeah, we love new beginnings, and, 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 but then the first time, the, the, the parking lot ministry, don't let them park their SUV in a compact slot. They want to switch their membership. Hmm? First time they get sick and nobody call them because they didn't tell nobody they were sick. And if the pastor was really a man of God, he'd have known. Because the Spirit would have told me. Huh? Now I don't feel fed and led. Huh? And now they're gone. They come fast and they go fast. Jesus, Jesus doesn't need us to set our mouth in motion. Matthew 15 and 8 says, you serve me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. You haven't sat down and counted up the cost. What is really costing of you? What's going to require of you? Because the way that this goes involves some high hills and, and, and some deep valleys and some chilly nights and some scorching sunlight and some headwinds to lean in and, 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 and some wounds along the way. And God isn't looking for any fair weather saints. Amen. He's not looking for any lukewarm pew occupants. Not trying to go to war with toy soldiers who jump up and promise the world ain't sat down and thought about what's really involved with this thing. And then we turn around and look for you and you're gone. Nobody looking for you to show up on shift Sunday and then you done shifted back to do nothingism the rest of the year? What is that but a grandstand? Nobody looking for you to show up on the Sunday your choir sing and then you on vacation, you on sabbatical the other months of the month? Ain't nobody looking to sit down then. We don't need you in the choir if we can't see you in the pew. Huh? The sanguine road, promising everything, coming through with nothing. Jesus rebukes that. He's looking for the commitment that comes after prayer and thought. Where people have come forth with saying, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Fools or no fools. Hurt or no hurt. Parking spot or no parking spot. Game on or no game on. 
I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. And I promised him that I would serve him till I die. Don't get on that sanguine road full with a lot of talk. We used to have a deacon back at Bethlehem Baptist Church, Deacon Elias Jones. He would always sit there and when members got up, start talking this and talking that. And he would say, y'all just beating your lips. Just, just, just beating your lips. And Jesus knew that they just, this man was just beating his lips. He said, don't get in that road where you set your mouth in motion for you set your mind in gear. But then it says that after he did that, then Jesus looked at another man. He said, follow me on this highway, Frank. And this man said, yeah, but I, I got to go bury my father. To which Jesus quickly retorted with consternation in his voice. He said, let man let the bed dead bury the dead. Seemed at first to casual readers that was a bit disrespectful to his father. Certainly there were obligations to those who taken care of us. Well, Jesus was getting at us something deeper. I'm asking you to accept the call to life and you distracted by matters of death. Let dead folk worry about dead things. I'm calling you to be stewards of things that bring life. And this is what we call the melancholic lane. People who are melancholy. Um, who just see something negative in everything. You talking about life, they talking about death. These are the people who no matter what time of the year it is, they gonna say, man, can you believe this weather? <laughs> it's 85 degrees outside, it's so hot. It's so hot. Oh my. Brother said to me, I said, man, it's good weather. He said, no, man, it's so hot. He said, I'm an African-American, not African. I can't stand all this heat. Really, in the Northwest, it's, you got good weather, you, it's too hot. <laughs> this same fella, you know, he said, man, can you believe this weather? All this rain is so cold. <laughs> All this rain around here, and then, man, and there ain't no rain, can you believe this weather? Everything getting dry, my grass burning out. We need some rain around here, man. Can you believe this weather? My kids want to play with the snowman. We don't get no snow around here. Man, can you believe this weather? This snow around here, you can't drive in, on these hills in this snow. No matter what, it ain't right. Y'all know somebody like that? No, 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 no matter what, it ain't right. And Jesus is dealing with them people who's on that melancholic road. We're trying to have a church meeting and plan for the future, and they want to stand up talking about, well, let me, let me be the devil's advocate for just one minute. The devil don't need no advocates in the Lord's house. The Lord needs some disciples. And first of all, if you're going to tell me up front that you're standing as an advocate for the devil, I want you to know you can get the hell out of here and go someplace else. Because yes, sir, yes, sir. we're looking for people who are trying to be faithful to the Lord and not advocates for the devil. Help me, somebody. The highway to holiness does not include that melancholic way that's always negative. People who are always talking down because they think down. The Bible says, as a person thinketh, so that he is. If you think negative, you're going to feel negative. Come on, somebody. If you talk down, then you feel down, and then you look down, then you become low down. I like the song that says, I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on. Come on, somebody. But then as he went along, then another man came to him and said, the Lord said to him, follow me. He said, yes, but I, uh, I, let me go home and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus said to him, he said, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. That, that, that's, that, that's, that's a hard Rebuke. That's like Corker saying, this president ain't fit. That's, that's, that's hard. Um, there's no ambiguity in that. That fitness for kingdom work requires people to have the ability to resist 
they resist the temptation to be backward in their glance. And, and people who are ADD and can't stay focused on, on the furrows that they're trying to plow ahead. Now he used in a, in a gruel analogy that these peasant farmers, most of whom were his listeners, could truly understand. That any, any, any plowman or plowwoman who got behind uh, that plow behind that mule knew that they, their work rose or fell on their ability to stay steadfast in their focus on what was ahead of them. And, and to manage that powerful beast that was much stronger than him, but was what, what moved based upon the, the signals that were sent them by the tension on the tethers, on the reins that were attached to them. It literally is impossible, Dennis, for one to, to, to hold the reins and look back without shifting one's shoulders. And if one is trying to plow straight rolls, that beast up there is trained. If I feel tension on the left rein, that means you want me to go to the left. And I feel tension on the right rein, it means you want me to move to the right. And if I turn my head to the left or the right, it's going to put tension on that rein, and that beast is going to turn accordingly. And if I look back while I'm trying to plow ahead, that beast is going to be miscommunicated to, and is going to turn and destroy the roles I've already done. Further complicating the fact is that the plows themselves were light and easily tipped over. So if the beast turned suddenly, the plow would tip over like an SUV that sits up high with a narrow wheelbase. They can't take sharp corners. They're prone to tipping over. And many of us tip over our own work. Many of us damage our own kingdom efforts for the sake of us constantly second-guessing ourselves. Because of unintended consequences, because of dis development, obstructions along the way. Newsflash, if you remember nothing else about this sermon, remember that just because you experience delays, detours, and disruptions along the journey does not mean you're on the wrong journey. A delay, a disruption, a detour along the way may be just that. A delay, a disruption, a detour on the way, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're headed on the wrong way. One can be called to work over in Gig Harbor and take I-5 and go along there take the, and, and, and then take the, the Gig Harbor exit and, and then get to the Narrows Bridge and find that the bridge is out. And the one thing you know, Jerry, is that you need to stop and don't go no further unless you plunge into the Puget Sound. But it doesn't mean you ain't supposed to get to Gig Harbor. Some people will interpret that as I'm not supposed to go to Gig Harbor. No, it only means you ain't supposed to take the bridge. It may mean you need to back up and take the ferry and go on over there. And if the ferry ain't running, it may mean you need to take one of these little crop duster planes and fly over there. There's more than one way to skin a cat. Just because plan A don't work don't mean that plan B won't work or plan C won't work. He may not come when you want him or how you want him. And sometimes we can't get nowhere in life. Because we spent all our time second guessing. Listen, when I was trying to get to seminary in 1984 and uh, drove from Tacoma, why Dotson 610, dropped my little sister Heather off at Lackland Air Force Base, and it was driving up uh, to uh, Rochester, New York, for there, 4,200 miles from my mama's driveway, 1242 South Ferry Street, to the 1100 South Goodman in Rochester, New York, where I was going to go to seminary. And that was before the days of GPS. Anybody remember before the days of GPS when you had MapQuest and before that Triptych? Those of you under 40, look up Google Triptych and MapQuest when you go home. And even before MapQuest and Triptych, you know what they had? You had to stop and ask a stranger. And I found out that folk out in the South Huh? They have a different idea of time and distance than folk in the north. Because I had to stop and ask the man outside of, uh, in, in the middle of somewhere between San Antonio and Dallas trying to get there, lost my trip ticket. He said, yeah, listen, here's, here's what you do, son. He said, you go around here, go around this bend here, and then you're going to come to a fork in the road and take a left here. That's going to take you to the highway and then just drive a while. I said, okay. And I took off and, and rolling seemed like I drove forever. And, I, and, and nothing came up but road. So I peeled off. I figured I must have missed it and asked a little man, another man and told him where I was trying to go. He said, oh, yeah, son, you headed in the right way. He said, but you just got to get back on that road and just drive a little while longer. I said, how much longer? He said, just, just, just keep going for a while. 
And I found out that people in the South, what their definition of a while is different from people in the city. A country mile is a lot longer than a city mile. You got to stop, you got to stop and get some gas before you go a country mile. But a city mile, you can travel when you already on E. Come on, somebody. So his definition of around the block and down the road and a while was a lot different from mine. I stopped four or five times. I finally ended up, but I delayed it myself because I kept getting off the road because I couldn't keep going for a while because a while didn't come up soon enough for me. Some of y'all can't get where you're going because a while is a lot longer than you. David said, I waited patiently for the Lord. I didn't wait fretfully. I didn't wait angrily. I didn't wait throwing tantrums. I didn't wait throwing up my hands in the air. Come on, somebody. Mahatma Gandhi said that he who would know God must be willing, must have the patience to be able to transfer the, the total water of the ocean to another spot drop by drop at the end of a straw. He or she that would know God and his purposes must have the patience to transfer the waters of the ocean to another place, drop by drop, at the end of a straw. And so this, 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 this last road, the, the phlegmatic road, the phlegmatic road, uh, the, the, the road of impatience, the road of, 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 of fretful, uh, the, the, the fretful waiting, the road of, of throwing tantrums because it ain't happening quick enough to us. It's a road that we can't get off because when God is trying to take us somewhere, we'll keep detouring. Because we don't know how to be still and see the purposes of God unfold. I remember my grandfather who wasn't much of a church man, but every now and then he would just say something random that made sense. He used to say stuff like, he that biteth in the back shall be nibbled on. He swore it was in the Bible. My grandma used to tell him, Nat, you lying, there ain't no Bible. He said, it is, Neil, it's in the Bible somewhere. It was consistent with you reap what you sow. And, uh, but, but he said to me once we were going over to Pullman, Washington, this long stretch of road between Tacoma and Pullman. And, he, and, and, and I was driving, I was riding with him, and he said to me, boy, he said, you, if you're going to do driving, you got to know something. I said, what is it, Big Daddy? That's what we called him, Big Daddy. He said, what is it, Big Daddy? He said, when, you, when you're going someplace, the first thing you got to do, he said, you got to buckle up. You got to buckle up. He said, after you buckle up, you got to adjust your mirrors, your side mirror, your rear view mirror. He said, and then you got to adjust your seat. Then he says, you got to set the climate control how you want it. He said, then you turn your radio on, what you want to listen to. And he said, and then you release your emergency brake, put the car in gear. He said, he's in the traffic. He said, and he just let the road come to you. You just got to keep driving and let the road come to you. And I stopped by to tell some impatient soul today, can't get nowhere because you keep getting off. You got to let the road come to you. Huh? The best things in life don't happen overnight. Only thing that happen overnight is a tragedy. Huh? The blessings of God can't be microwaved. You got to put them in the crock pot of patience. Trial produces patience. Patience does not frustrate. Patience does not disappoint. God can open doors that no one can shut. If you can stand there at the door, you know God on the other side. Just keep knocking. He said, seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open. Ask and it shall be given unto you. If you let the road come to you. And, uh, but if you look at these stories... There's a thread that hangs them all together in this deductive exercise where he tells us in these exercises, he tells us what lanes not to get into. Don't get into the caloric road, angry to be angry, acting out of anger. Even if it's understandable, if you act out of it, it's still destructive. Don't get into the sanguine road where you popping up, promising stuff you ain't really thought about. And God don't want insincere uh, proclamations. That's not commitment. And... Uh, he doesn't want us to get in the melancholic role where just everything's negative. Um, and he doesn't want us to get in the phlegmatic road where we just uh, don't know how to wait and get frustrated because God won't behave according to the way we think God ought to be. And, uh, but to each of these fellas and ladies, he simply said, follow me. Follow me. 
Stick with me. When I take the hills, take the hills. When I take the valleys, take the valleys. When I cross the rivers, cross the rivers. Because as Harriet Tubman say, God won't call me any place God can't keep me. Amen. Follow me. Stay in the lane. The GPS says stay, don't get to the right or the left and get on the detour. Take I-5 South and just take it through till you get to the airport. That's what David said when he was following the Lord. He said, yea, though I walk through. <laughs> Pam, we're going through. We're going through the fire. We're going through the flood. We're going through the heartbreak. We're going through the betrayal. We're going through the disappointment. We're going through the bigotry. We're going through the ism of every kind. We're going through the setback. We're going through the pain. We're going through breast cancer. We're going through prostate cancer. We're going through the downs in the economy, the ups in the economy. We're going through our own problems of, of addiction and heartbreak and brokenness. We're going through it all because through it all, we've learned to trust in Jesus. Through it all, we've learned to trust in God. Through it all, we've learned that earth has no sorrow that heaven, can, heaven cannot cure. And God, at the end of the day, still can do more for us than the whole world against us if we just stay on that road. I remember a song we sing growing up, follow Jesus, take no chance getting lost, follow Jesus. There are deserts you have to cross, follow Jesus, but he's got a safe mountain plan. And if Jesus can't get you to the top, there's nobody else who can. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, don't get in the wrong lane. Follow Jesus. Jesus is calling and waiting for you let us stand willing and able to see you through don't need to worry he knows what to do i want to tell you he's waiting for you. jesus is calling jesus 